Pick something, aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser. Then maybe your aim will change. That's okay, but at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. Well, that's exciting. And I think that's something that's open for everyone. And I think you can find yourself in a situation that's so dire that there's no escape from it. But that doesn't matter because the best we have might not always work, but it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away. It's still the best we have. I mean, everyone dies and so we fail in some sense. The fact that a symphony ends doesn't mean that it wasn't worth listening to. Need motivation? Watch this top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jordan Peterson and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, look where it's important. You look where you think it's important to look. So I'll say that again. You look where you think it's important to look. And that means that, well, a hierarchy of importance is no different than a hierarchy of value. They are the same thing. A hierarchy of priority is the same as a hierarchy of value. And a hierarchy of priority and a hierarchy of value and an ethic are all the same thing. Right, because you're going to look at what you believe to be of cardinal importance. Otherwise you look, well, if you're talking to someone and you look at their feet, that's not going to be going very well, right? First of all, they're not going to be very impressed with you because they actually want you to look at their eyes. And that's because we communicate value with our eyes and we do that directly. Our eyes have even evolved to do that. Our eyes have whites around the iris so that you can see where people point them because it's that important to know what people think is important. We see the world through a structure of value. And I think that a huge part of that structure of value is actually derived from the entire set of texts, entire set of texts and their interrelationship that have the biblical corpus at their base. And so it seems to me that you, I think you can make a pretty damn strong case, maybe on scientific grounds, that you can't see the world except through the lens of the Bible. Like literally, you actually can't see it. Now, if it's not the Bible, it might be some other corpus of texts, but it might be. It isn't. And if it was, well, is it gonna be a corpus of texts that we share? Because if it isn't, then we can't share our perceptions and our values, and if we can't share those, then we fight. Those are the options, right? We either stabilize our hierarchies of value in some way that we agree upon mutually, or we fight. That's, or we're unbelievably chaotic and confused, and that'll just produce fighting in any case. And so we have this structure of texts built from the bottom up. It's predicated on the biblical narratives, and the texts exist in relationship to those underlying narratives, and derive a fair bit of their meaning from the meaning of the underlying narratives, and and vice versa, you know. Um, and so then the biblical, is it possible that biblical truth is the sort of truth that is the precondition for truth? Right, because you think, well, it's religious people make the claim, people of the Bible make the claim, the Bible is true. Well, there's all sorts of different kinds of truth. That's, that's an interesting claim, but it's not very elaborated. It's, it's insufficient. Um, and you know, often what happens to Christians when they debate skilled atheists like Richard Dawkins is they treat the Bible like it's a scientific theory and Dawkins just mops the floor with them because it's actually not a scientific theory compared to scientific theories. And so as soon as you go there, well, it's like a scientific theory. It's like, no, it's not. It's not. And so does that mean it's not true? Well, it means that if the only thing you think is true is a scientific theory, but I don't think that you can practice science except within an ethical framework that's not in itself science. And so it's possible that there is a deeper truth than the scientific truth, which is the ethic that has to be there a priori before you can even begin to do science. Rule number three, encourage reading. We should make much more of an effort to ensure that kids are unbelievably proficient readers. And a lot of that is going to involve early automatization of letter and phoneme and syllable and word recognition. So, because what happens is when you teach a child to read, first of all, you teach them the alphabet and the sounds. And we have an alphabetic language, thank God, because it makes things much simpler. And so 
You teach them the letters and then the two letter combinations and then the three letter combinations. And then they can sound out syllables and then they get words. But it isn't until you can read phrases automatically at a glance that you can read for content and pleasure. And so a lot of kids get stuck, especially if they don't come from particularly literate homes where, where all of this is sort of taught, you know, maybe starting at, you know, 12 months when they're first dragging a book around and, and becoming familiar with the book as an object, right, before they even learn to read. You got to get kids through that automatization phase and that requires intense mass practice. And that's not that intrinsically interesting, right? But if you can get them to the point where they can read for content, well then, it starts to become interesting, just as interesting, let's say, as going to a movie or perhaps playing a video game. And so that has to be made an absolute priority. And, and the fa if the faculties of education were doing their job, they would have produced technology to solve that problem for virtually every child, because it is only a matter of practice. Smarter kids will learn faster, but with enough practice, pretty much everybody is gonna get there. So, and then there's the marketing issue. It's like, well, why should you read? Well, do you want to be stupid? <laughs> do you want to be stupid? What happens when you're stupid? You walk into walls because you don't see them. And if someone comes along who's more educated than you, more literate and cannier, they'll just, you'll lose, man. You'll lose. And you'll lose too because you can't think properly. So you won't aim at the right things and you won't be informed by the great individuals of the past. And you need that. We're historical creatures. This isn't optional. So par part of it has to be marketing, for lack of a better word. It's not really that. It's an explanation. Why be literate? Because it makes you, it helps you become who you could be. It helps you move out into the world and have your great adventure and to bring people along. God only knows what you can do if you've got your words lined up properly. And young men would listen to that if someone who knew what they were talking about was telling them that as you found out. Rule number four, be the right person. If you want an answer to the first question, which is how do I find the person who's right for me, you actually start by asking the second question, which is what can I bring to the table for someone else? And if you're really good at bringing something to the table for someone else, hey man, people might be lining up to be your partner. And if they're not, then you might think, well, maybe I'm just not bringing the right thing to the table. And that's worth thinking, especially if you're desperate, you're lost and you're alone. It's like, hmm, maybe I got this wrong. And I, you know, I usually sort of top that with the suggestion that even if you did find the person who was perfect for you and they're that perfect, what makes you think they wouldn't take one look at you and run screaming away? And they likely would if they were that perfect because, you know, really, are you that much of a catch? <laughs> and if you think you are, you know, that might be part of the problem. Um, <laughs> So, so look, so that's one, right? Intimate relationship. So I would say to you at the crossroads, develop a vision for your relationship. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, maintain moral orientation. How do you bear the suffering that is at the crux of life without becoming tempted and embittered? That's really, really difficult. Now, you know, someone might point out, go ahead and be bitter, see where that gets you. And if you have any sense, and generally people have at least some, they know that being sick and bitter is worse than just being sick. And that being, right, it's worse, but it's very hard temptation to avoid. Sometimes you wanna be bitter just out of spite, in some sense, because things are so terrible, all you've got left is your willingness to shake your fist, you know, and say, well, you know, really? Is this like this many poisonous snakes? Really? That's like, maybe I could have learned with just one or two, not a hundred. And so, but 
we're stuck, we're all stuck with that. And I think we're stuck with it at every level of our life in some sense is how do we maintain a high order moral orientation in spite of suffering and malevolence. Yeah. Rule number six, have a clear perception of reality. I first started to understand that what we perceive in some real sense isn't exactly material reality. And partly that's because that's actually impossible. And I mean that technically. And that's mm -hmm. something we could go into in great depth because that realization paralyzed a number of fields. It, it really started to come to the forefront in many fields in, in, about, in the early 1960s, especially in AI. Yeah. When the AI types started to try to make machines that could see the world in some sense like we do and then act in the world. And f what they instantly realized was that, oh, there isn't just something there that we see. This is way harder than we ever possibly imagined. In fact, it's so hard that it looks like it might be impossible in some sense. So how the hell do we do it? And like, we still don't have robots that can move around the world like we do. Sure, you know, sure. endless I'm, generations. I'm not, sure of, I'm not, I'm not, maybe it's improved. The last time I looked at this great detail, we didn't have robots that could fold laundry very efficiently either. So it's, Yeah, well, a lot of these so-called simple things like seeing, well, it's half your brain. It takes you half your brain to see. And most animals, like we see way better than almost all animals. Say. Really? Eagles, not, raptors. Really? Because really? I would yeah. have bald eagles in my back. Yard yeah, they can the see. They, they, their eyes are the same size as yours. And they have two foveal spots. Eagles, uh, falcons, they're the animals that can see better than us. But other than that, it's us and it's half our brain, just to see. Well, so why? Well, you're a physicist, you understand that reality is composed of levels of being, right? From the subatomic up to the cosmic. It's like, well, first of all, how do you specify the proper level of analysis? Well, one of the things that's quite interesting psychologically is that we have short words are generally used to describe things that manifest themselves to us at our level of analysis cat. We see a cat. We don't see a species. We don't see cat sub parts. We see this cat. Well, why? Well, that's, th that's the level that's most biologically relevant to us, given our embodiment. That's an evolutionary answer. And so we see what we see. First of all, what we see a lot of is memory, but we see something that's overlaid on the world. We actually see the overlay. And hopefully it reflects what's underneath, and generally it does, and it's a hell of a shock to us when, when we make a perceptual error. But I uh, see, I st and then I started to learn, especially from reading Jeffrey Gray, that we, we also see the world within a motivated frame. And he was influenced by Norbert Wiener, who was one of the world's first cybernetic s sure. scientists, essentially, a great yeah, influence on AI. Yeah, yeah. And, and Gray never talked about narrative, but the frame that he described that we see, and in animals as well, basically has a point A and a point B, so we're always moving towards a goal if we're mobile animals. And I thought, oh, well, the description of the movement from point A to point B, that's the simplest unit of meaning, that's a story. And then I learned that a better story is a story about how stories transform. And so th those are actually perceptual frames of reference that transform. And then I understood that if you don't have respect for the transformation process above all else, then you can't transform your perceptual frames when necessary, and then you can't adapt to error and that destroys you. And so, so that's, that's all part of that. Rule number seven, organize around your goals. When you organize your perceptions around a goal, and that provides a container for your negative emotions. So if I want to walk across the stage because I think that getting to the other side is preferable to being here, so that's a hierarchy of value, that place is better than this place, then when I observe myself undertaking the actions that will get me to that place, that's comforting and provides security because it shows that the structure that I'm using to organize my perceptions and to reduce the world to a manageable to manageability is sufficiently accurate so that I can implement it. And so we seem to inhabit those structures all the time. Whenever we're looking at the world, whenever we're interacting, we specify a goal, and so that's an ethical enterprise, and we organize our emotions within the specification of that goal, and then we produce hierarchies of goals. So, you know, you go to, you, 
you sit down in front of your computer so you can write a paper, and you write a paper so that you can finish an essay, and you finish an essay so that you can get a grade in a class, and get a grade in a class so that you can graduate with a degree, and you do that so that you can get a job, and you do that so that you can be, what, a good husband, a good wife, a good citizen, and you do that so you can be a good person. There's a hierarchy of ethic that permeates the entire enterprise right from the microcosm up to the macrocosm, and I think that's something like the whole landscape of religious value with the outermost container, so be a good person, let's say that's the ultimate aim of the religious enterprise, that's something like the imitation of Christ in the most fundamental sense, and all the things that you do within that are a reflection of that, or you're confused and chaotic, and if everyone's doing that at the same time, then you have a society that's integrated and aiming up and capable of telling the truth. It's something like that. Does that seem reasonable? And so, so what's the proposition here? Well, I think when we describe these frameworks of perception, the name we give to the description of a framework of perception is a story. And I think the reason that we like stories so much is because we need to establish frameworks of perception in order to operate in the world and to allow ourselves to be integrated peacefully with other people. And so we're extraordinarily interested in anything that has a narrative basis. And the reason we're interested in that is because we're trying to build within ourselves and collectively the structure that enables us to perceive the world without undue confusion and chaos and in a manner that provides some value to us and some sustainability. That's the goal overall. And that seems to me to be the goal of the entire religious enterprise. And so, is it possible that, well, I guess that's, as, that's the claim I thought I'd elaborate out a little bit today, is that the Bible is true in a very strange way. It's true in that it provides the basis for truth itself. And so it's like a meta-truth, right? Without it, there, without it, there couldn't even be the possibility of truth. And so maybe that's the most true thing. The most true thing isn't some truth per se, it's that which provides the precondition for all judgments of truth. And it seems to me that I can't see any holes in that argument. And I can't see any holes in it from a scientific perspective either, because I think we do know well enough now as scientists that the problem of deriving ethical direction from the collection of facts is an intractable problem. There's too many facts. There's an infinite number of facts. They do not provide an unerring guide for action. They can't. There's too many of them. They have to be prioritized. And as soon as they are prioritized, well, then you're in the ethical domain. And then that begs the question, what's the valid ethical domain? And the postmodern answer is, well, there isn't one. It's all the expression of domination and power. And I, I think that's nonsense. I, I don't think that's a tenable solution. I think that we stumbled onto the proper answer in some sense in our religious enterprise, which is that we aim at what's highest, or, or we don't. We aim at what's highest jointly, or we're divided. We aim at what's highest, and that gives meaning to all the things we do that are subordinate parts of that. We aim at what's highest, and that's what collects us and gives us structure, all of that, you know, singly and jointly. And that's all what we've been trying to communicate all these centuries as we've been trying to communicate the whole religious corpus, generation after generation, and to sort this out and to straighten it out and to try to understand it. And uh, I think that's where we're at. Now, you know. Rule number eight, accept suffering. If you're looking for certainty, the reality of suffering is certain. I mean, what do you accept as evidence above all else? That's a good question, that's a hard question, but I would say pain is up there. It's very difficult not to believe in the reality of your own pain. Um, it's somewhat easier not to believe in the reality of other people's pain. That's not so easy either, you know, um, but it's, your, your pain seems to be undeniably real. And so it does beg a question, which is, you know, 
if pain is undeniably real, is that which overcomes pain even more real? And I think that's, in some sense, that's the idea that lurks behind the idea of the resurrection. Rule number nine, remain noble. When you see people who are noble in spite of their suffering, it is ennobling, it is uplifting. Re like, really it is. And, um, and it, it's been striking to me too. People want to be encouraged in that direction. I mean, part of the reason that my lectures, I would say, have been successful to the degree that they have been is because people find them encouraging. Mm -hmm. And that actually seems to work, like it seems to be positive. Because it, it isn't necessarily good news. Well, it seems to be. Yeah. I mean, it isn't necessarily the case that that would be the case, you know, because it could have been that I would have said encouraging things to people. There's more to you than meets the eye, and you're capable of more than you're demanding of yourself. And, you know, if you took on your responsibility and faced the things that you're trying to avoid, that your life would be richer and better and for you and for everyone around you. And the result of that could have been that thousands of people would come to me and say, you know, I gave that a pretty good shot and it, your advice is really awful and everything is, well, seriously, like I took on that responsibility, it just bloody crushed me and I'm way worse off than I was before and everything's gone to hell around me and like, thanks a lot, buddy. And th that, and that, it's not like that's a completely incomprehensible possibility. But that doesn't seem to be what happens, is what generally happens is that young people in particular, but not only, come to me and say, look, I've been trying to take on more responsibility and to face the things I've been avoiding, and everything is way better. It's like, okay, well, hmm, isn't that something? Maybe and, you're something. Well, then you ask yourself, well, what's the limit of that? Because that's the religious question, fundamentally, is, well, if you took on all the responsibility you could take on, and you faced everything that you needed to face, what would you be like? Who would you be? And how would the world transform around you? And well, if, if the partial answer is, well, if I do that a little bit, things get a fair bit better, then the next question might be, well, what if you did that completely? And I don't think that's possible in some sense, right? It's like, you know, perfection is a horizon that always recedes, but it isn't obvious to me what the upper limit of that is, and certainly we do see people, I mean, saints, let's yeah, that's say. Yeah, say, it's a Mother right, Teresa, who, it's a Francis of Assisi. Who kind of push the limit, and they, miraculous things happen around them, and maybe in the literal sense, and if not in the literal sense, close enough, you know, for all intents and purposes, and so that's heartening. I mean, I tear myself apart about this in many ways, because I think, Perhaps it's possible to take on too much responsibility and to crush yourself as a consequence. Maybe that's a sin of pride. Who knows, it's certainly possible. But my experience so far has been that when you see people bear their suffering nobly, there's nothing in that but good. That's something. And then when you see people take on more responsibility and decide that they're going to aim up and, and confront their suffering honestly and forthrightly, that their lives get better and the lives of people around them get better too. And so it's, that's very strange as well because it also means that the pathway to less suffering is through suffering, right? And that's kind of, that would be hopeful if the world was constituted that way. It's like, well, there's suffering. How do you make it worse? Run away. How do you make it better? Confront it. Yeah, but it's suffering. It's like, yeah, but it's there. There it is. It's right there. It's a precondition for existence or something like that. And it's like you have something important to do as well. And you confront it. And that's the pathway to transcending it. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is encourage greatness. I was watching this movie, King Arthur, by Guy Ritchie. And when, when the new king, young king Arthur, takes his sword... He has flashbacks to his evil uncle killing his father. And it just, it's so terrible that he can't hold on to the sword. And I thought, well, what's Richie doing there? It's, well, that's the case for all of us, isn't it? Because when we look into the past and we see our evil uncles, it's just a complete bloody catastrophic mess, isn't it? Slavery and genocide and war and oppression and like, and that's on all of us, isn't it? And it's always lurking there in the background. And so is that male power? Well, 
Yes, in some ways. I mean, if you don't give a man a sword, he can't use a sword, right? So not giving him a sword is one way of making sure he's peaceful, but it's not the, it's not the optimal way. And besides, if you cripple men, they become far more dangerous. They become dangerous in an un terrible underground fashion. Of course, the same is exactly true if you cripple women, but we're speaking particularly of boys because I suppose there's an education crisis among boys and young men. Well, you want to encourage that power because it's actually a tremendous force for good if it's brought under control. And so, but that's a hard thing to get right. And it also requires a lot of trust and work on the part of women because they want to, it's like beauty and the beast, right? Because beauty entices that beast who's a real, who's real, but uncivilized and dangerous. She sort of entices him into becoming fully developed. And that's what a woman has to do when she, you know, has that work project that she marries or has a long-term relationship with. But it's much better to encourage with, with faith and trust. And this is another thing you can do in your own household. This is so useful, man. If, if you get good at doing this, your life will get so much better. You can't believe it. Is watch the people around you. And whenever they do anything that you would like to see repeated on a regular basis, tell them exactly what they did in detail with, you know, be positive about it, obviously, <laughs> and, and just indicate that you noticed. And because I saw this when I was grading student essays, you know, and so I taught this seminar for a long time and I was trying to teach kids how to write. They were in their fourth year of university in the honors psych program. You'd think they'd bloody well already know how to write, but they didn't. And so I'd have them write a four page essay on a given topic and then they had to rewrite that to a six page essay and then they had to rewrite that to an age eight page essay. And the first essay I graded, I, it was only 5% of their grade and I told them, I'm going to cut you into ribbons, but it doesn't matter because it's you know 5% of your grade and so they could tolerate that. And generally by the third essay, they had written the best thing they'd ever written in their life and they learned so fast it was unbelievable. But one of the things I noticed was that they did a little testing with the first essay. They'd hand in something, it was just like, God, formulaic, boring. They're, they weren't in it at all, you know? There was nothing of the person in there. There was no thought. There was just the kind of psychobabble that they'd learned, especially if they were in faculties of education. And, <laughs> and it was dry and dull and, and everything about it was wrong. And so those are hard to grade, right? It's like, what's wrong with my essay? Well, the words aren't right, the phrases, they're not so good. They're not organized well into sentences. The sentences aren't sequenced well in the paragraphs. The paragraphs, paragraphs don't make a coherent argument and the entire thing is empty. But other than that, <laughs> no problem. It was often easier just to rewrite those essays than to grade them. No, so in any case though, one of the things I did learn was that even in an essay like that, there is usually like one sentence or two sentences buried on like page three that was an actual thought and reasonably clearly stated and somewhat gripping, you know? It was like the person popped out from all the background rubbish and said, well, what about, what about this? <laughs> and if you saw that and checked it and said, hey, you hit the mark right there, the next essay would be like two thirds that. And that was really fun to see. And then maybe by the third essay, maybe it was all like that. And then they were really thrilled. It's like, wow, I wrote this, you know? And it was sort of the culmination, well, it was a fourth year seminar. It was the culmination of their, their career as a psychology undergraduate. So that was great fun. But you can do that in your own household. If, 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 if the envious part of you isn't jealous of the revelation of the goodness of the person. When I was 25 or so, I probably weighed about 138 pounds. I smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day. I drank tremendous amount of alcohol. I was from Northern Alberta, this rough little town up in Northern Alberta called Fairview. And you know, there were long winters there and my friends were heavy drinkers and most of them dropped out of school by the time they were 15 or 16, went off to work on the oil rigs. And you know, it was a rough town and we drank a lot. I started when I was 14 and you know, um, and so, I was, I had a lot of bad habits, let's say, and uh, things that were, and I wasn't in great shape physically, and I was also still intellectually obsessed by, as I am now, and uh, so that would have been, 
that would have been in 85. But when I, but I decided around then, about 85, 84, something like that, maybe a little earlier, that I was really going to try to get my act together. And uh, so I started doing that. I, you know, I, first of all, I, I quit smoking. Well, that took a long time because I eventually had to quit drinking too in order to quit smoking. And I started working out and playing sports, which I'd never done. I had a fine time when I was a kid, and but uh, I needed really to get disciplined. And I had to do it because I was working on these hard problems that, you know, that I've been discussing with all of you and I've been working on them really, you know, obsessively since I was probably about 18, maybe even earlier than that. And got to the point around 25 when I was in graduate school trying to get my PhD, so doing all my research. Like I published 15 papers by the time I graduated with my PhD, which was by, I think, by a fairly large measure, the most papers that any graduate student at that time had ever published at McGill. I think that's right. Might have been twice as many or maybe twice as many, maybe even three times as many. And at the same time, I wrote Maps of Meaning, which was a terrible, terrible, terribly difficult thing to do because I was writing about three hours a day doing that and I couldn't do all that and continue with my misbehavior you know my sort of my what what would you say my 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 hedonistic my hedonistic my massive hedonistic consumption of alcohol and all of that I just couldn't keep it up and also work seriously on the issues that were at hand so you know I had to stop that's a sacrifice I had to stop messing about and straighten myself out. On that point of understanding my inadequacies or someone's inadequacies, I, I really believe um, that it's really difficult to undergo self-development if you don't have self-awareness. And I was, I was really trying to understand from your writings how someone is to build their self-awareness. It's almost like the unknown unknown. If you don't have yeah. it, how do you build the thing? Well, I know a good exercise for that. It's like a prayer in some sense. In fact, I would say it's proper prayer. If you want to know something about yourself, sit on your bed one night and say to yourself, you got to mean this. Like, you got to be desperate. This is no game, this. It's like, my life is not everything I want it to be. And perhaps it's not everything that I need it to be. And by need, I mean, my life is so unbearable that the suffering that's attendant upon that is make me nihilistic, cynical, bitter, resentful, homicidal, genocidal, in the, unable to have a good relationship, pro, prone to punish people for their virtues because of my jealousy, uh, driving the proclivity to see evil everywhere except within my own heart. Like, these are problems, man. And you ask yourself, you sit on the bed and say, okay, man, I'm ready to learn something. Like, what, what's one thing I'm doing wrong that I know I'm doing wrong that I could fix that I would fix. It's like, you meditate on that, you'll get an answer. And it won't be one you want, but it'll be the necessary one. You know, and it, it's often something that will point you to small things. So Carl Jung said, people in the modern world don't see God because they don't look low enough. And so imagine you're in your messy bedroom, you know, and you're sitting on the edge of the bed trying to have an honest dialogue with yourself. And the little voice says, you know, it's pretty disgusting in here. And you think, well, I'm way above such trivial niceties as organizing my room. It's like, well, that's pride. That's arrogance. If you're above organizing what's actually yours, how in the world are you ever going to organize anything else? And so you get on your knees and you think, well, it's time to you know, take a brush to the toilet and maybe that's where you start. And so, and that works, like that works. You start making those micro improvements, like real micro improvements, real on the ground, actual micro improvements to things you know that are wrong, you'll improve unbelievably rapidly. You have to make a decision in your life. And this is, this is a decision and I would say that it's a voluntary element of faith because it isn't exactly evidence-based. It's more like something you decide before you even look at the evidence. It's more like you decide to stake your life on this. Like, you know, if you decide to get married to someone, you don't really do it on the basis of the evidence that you're going to have a happy life because you don't have that evidence. You do it, you decide that you're going to make a happy life with this person and that it's worth the risk. So you, you get married as an expression of faith. Okay, and, and so faith doesn't 
mean believing things that no one with any sense would believe. Faith sometimes means putting a stake in the sand and saying, here is where I stand in some sense regardless. And you do that when you get married. You do that maybe when you, you know, pledge allegiance to a friend. You have a best friend and you want to maintain that friendship as long as you possibly can. It's, it's, it's a decision of faith. Um, maybe you do that when you decide a career, when you go to university, because you could have done something else, right? But you chose that. So that's where you put your faith. Um, and like I said, that doesn't mean believing what no reasonable person would believe. Okay, so back to God is love. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about being first instead of God. Um, and being is the totality of experience that we're going to define that it that way for the purposes of this discussion. Being is what there is instead of nothing. And you experience that as a conscious creature. Being is what you experience as a conscious creature. It includes all your emotions, all your motivations, all your subjective experience, as well as everything that's objective. Okay, so it seems to me that all things considered, it's a useful move of faith to act as if you love being. And if you love something, then you want the best in it to flourish. And so you, maybe you decide deep in your soul that it would be better for you to act towards an end that makes everything that's good better, that that's the best way to live, to make everything that's good better, and maybe to restrict the development of everything that's malevolent and evil within yourself and in the broader world insofar as you're able to do that. And so I think that's an expression of love, is that because when you love something, you care for it. And the proper attitude towards being, I think, is care. And so, so that's one element of God is love. God being <laughs> analogous in some way to being. Um, now, we could look at God more classically as the creator of being. If you assume being is good, well, it's not much of a leap to assume the creator of being is good. And maybe you adopt an attitude towards the creator of being, and that's also love, and you open your heart to existence, and maybe that's the most effective means of having existence open its heart to you. So, for example, you know, if you love other people, you want the best for them, you want the best in you to serve the best in them, if you love them, and you trust them courageously, so you open yourself up to them, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that that's how you elicit the best from them, the best that can be elicited. You, you're going to get hurt sometimes and betrayed, but that's going to happen no matter what approach you take. I think that's the most effective approach. And that is perhaps the most effective approach to existence per se, to approach it with love and courage. And, and so that's how that looks to me. Is it a feeling like loving a person? Yes, I think it is. I, th I think it is a feeling like loving a person. It's, it's the generalization of that care that you would have for a child, your child, your, your brother, your sister, a family member. It's the generalization of that to the broader domain of, of existence, to broader domain of, domains of existence. And I think that's a skill in some sense, right? I mean, if you're good at loving and caring for your family, but you can expand that outward so that more people are brought under that umbrella, then, well, assuming you can manage that, it's very difficult. It seems to me that that's laudable. It seems to me that we spontaneously admire and would like to imitate people who are capable of that. And so you see that when you have a job or you and you encounter a boss who takes you under his or her wing and helps develop you or you find a teacher who's particularly inspiring or you work for an entrepreneur who's inspiring and who also opens doors for you. Um, they're acting with love as far as I'm concerned. They want the best in them to serve the best in you. And that's very, very motivating for everyone. And that's the proper basis of our social relationships, not power, for God's sake. So can love balance out the crushing responsibility? That's a sophisticated question. I don't know the answer to that. Love is warmer than responsibility. Love is, the, is part of empathy and agreeableness. It's a different dimension than responsibility, which is more part of conscientiousness and sort of a cold virtue. I don't know if it balances out the crushing responsibility, but I think it's the emotional analog to the crushing responsibility. 
right? So maybe there's love and duty and, and they run parallel in, in if you're an ethical person. That's not all there is to ethics, but you know, love and duty, they're they're important and, and maybe they're better together than they would be as independent um, entities. At the end of God's creation, describing how order emerges from chaos or being from potential, there's this strange line, which is probably the most important line that's ever been written in our culture, at the basis of our culture. And that is that men and women are made in the image of God. And what does that mean? Well, if God is that which confronts potential with truth and courage and makes what's good out of potential, that seems to indicate that we have the same faculty, like on a smaller scale, we're not omniscient, but we're not bloody well nothing. Our conscious is integrally tied into the structure of being in some manner we don't understand. And it certainly is the case that we take what isn't and turn it is into what is. That's something, man. That's, that's quite the trick we've been able to manage. And so we're made in that image. And so what are we supposed to do? Well, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to type our letters and make our phrases and construct our sentences and build our paragraphs and put our chapters together and make our books and communicate to people and straighten out the damn culture and constrain the malevolence and ignorance that besets each of us and push nature back and extend ourselves out into the unknown and confront the potential that's there in illimitable quantities and make the world better than it could be otherwise. To move it away from hell, which and it can certainly become that, and toward heaven to the degree that we can manage that. And that is a good enough goal. That's the thing. You need something, you know, because your life is tough. It's hard. You need something that, the, you know, you need something to get out of bed for and fight for. And that's something, right? To fight, let's say, against hell and for heaven. That's something to fight for. You want to be convinced about this. Like read a little bit about hell. Read the Gulag Archipelago or read Ordinary Men or read The Rape of Nanking, or read about what happened in Nazi Germany during Auschwitz and all the catastrophes of the 20th century and see if you believe in hell and see if you think, well, maybe not having that happen anymore would be a good idea. And then think about maybe that's something you could contribute to. Then it wouldn't have to happen anymore. And that would be a good thing. And God only knows what great things we could manage under such conditions. We're becoming incredibly technologically powerful. What would it be like if we became equally wise? Well, that would really be something. God only knows what we could manage in the next 20 years or the next 100 years, you know? We're running at 40%, most of us. You know, because we're half in and half out. And it's not surprising, because life is difficult. It's like, well, what if you were 90% in? or 95% in, or, or all in, because you're all in anyways, right? It's a, it's a life and death game. No one gets out of this, everyone dies. You might as well commit yourself, and you might as well commit yourself to the highest good that you can attain, because why not? It'll imbue your life with meaning. It's hard, the responsibility's there, but all the meaning's in the responsibility, and that'll make your life better. It'll make your family's life better, and it should make your culture better. Maybe it'd make the world better. It's like, that'll justify your damn miserable existence at three o'clock in the morning when you're wondering what the hell you're doing here. And that's a good thing, because there's gonna be days when you're aching and tired and sore, and there's people in your family that are sick, and you're cynical and bitter, and you need a reason to get up, and you think, yeah, well, a little more heaven and a little less hell. Maybe I can pull that off today and tomorrow and next week. And that's worth struggling forward for. And so that's how it looks to me. Becoming more articulate is definitely, I would say, that's the primary array of weapons. So, I mean, physical prowess is something and, and it's not nothing, that physical confidence that comes along with that as well. But the same thing replicated at the level of the ability to communicate and to think, um, that's a way broader field of, of battle and opportunity. So this is one thing that isn't taught well, especially to boys. Um, it's more important to teach it to boys, I would say, because they're more uh, skeptical of such, of the educational enterprise in general, generally speaking, partly because they're less obedient partly because they're less agreeable. That's particularly true for disagreeable boys. 
And agreeable boys get higher grades independent of their IQ and their, and their academic achievement because they're easier to deal with. So what do you tell disagreeable boys? There's nothing that makes you more formidable than verbal competence, than being able to articulate, be able to think, to marshal your arguments, right? Some battlefield metaphor to get everything in order, to get all your information straight you know, to marshal your forces. And so, I mean, that's part of the reason that rap artists are so popular, especially among disaffected young men, black and white alike, because they're unbelievably articulate. Like they have this incredible verbal prowess. It's unbelievably attractive. You know, and it's associated with genuine artistic um, and redemptive activity, often focusing on something that's approximately the voice of the underclass, let's say, but a powerful voice, right? And it's interesting to see how many young white guys identify with that. There's so many rules that are great, but what do you think is probably if, if, if somebody was to read those books and there's one rule that you're like, this rule of the 24 I've given you over these past few years, I, you can absolutely not get this one wrong. Which rule would that be? Tell the truth or at least mm. don't lie. Because you can't tell the truth, right? Because who are you to tell the truth? That's a, that's a mighty tall order, man. But you can stop mm. saying things that you know are lies. And that will change your life if you do that. Mm. And it's crucial. Why would it change their life? Well, how can you adapt to reality when you falsify it? And you mm. think, well, I'm just lying to other people. It's no, no, you're not. You can't just lie to other people because what you say becomes you, especially if you practice it because we build ourselves out of words. And that can be lies in action too. It's like, don't, don't say things you know to be false. That's a, that's a good start, man. And it allies yourself with the truth. And that, like, how can that be a bad idea? Ma imagine that what is true reflects reality, which is sort of the definition of true. How can mm. failing to align yourself with reality work? How is that possibly going to work? Well, you say, well, I can, you know, if I lie, I get away with something. It's like, no, you don't. You, I, I tell you, I swear this is true. In all of my clinical practice, I have never, ever seen anyone ever get away with anything even once. You mm. think the chickens won't come home to roost. It's like, all that that means is you're too stupid to see what your lies cause or too blind or too self-deceptive. You just don't see it. And so you don't get away with anything, nothing. It's terrifying to, to actually understand that. It's terrifying. Mm. What if you can't get away with anything ever, you know? Well, that's the judgmental God, fundamentally. That's a very yeah. old idea, and it's an old idea for a reason. And of course you can't get away with anything, because imagine that you took a, a flexible plastic comb, you know, and you bent it backwards, and you say, well, I got away with that. It's like, well, what's going to happen when you let go? It's going to snap back and hit you in the face. And that's, that's life, man. You warp the structure of reality. You think you are someone who can warp the structure of reality with your words and get away with it? Really? No, man, that should, that should terrify you right to the core of your soul. You're not God. My rule, too, is treat yourself as if you're someone responsible for helping. And it's sort of predicated on the idea that regardless of your inadequacies and your malevolence, which, you know, I'm sure you have many inadequacies and no shortage of malevolence, just like everyone else, regardless of that, you have a moral obligation, so that would be a responsibility, to assume that despite all evidence that there's actually something in, of intrinsic worth about you, and that as a consequence, you're duty-bound to treat yourself like that is true. And then it turns out that if you do that, well, then your life gets better. 
And, and I don't mean happier exactly, although I would say it gets happier. I mean it gets richer and more meaningful and deeper and, and more worthwhile and, and you become more educated and you become wiser and, and, and you treat yourself with more respect and you're a better model for other people and you're a better father or a better sister or better mother, whatever it happens to be. It's, and you're less ridden by that guilt that's, that gnaws at you and shame that's there otherwise saying, you're not what you could be, you're not what you could be. And that's a hell of a voice to get rid of and it's certainly not one that's easy to ignore. So that's a pretty good, that, that idea that there's something divine, let's say, that resides within you of ultimate worth. Um, even as a philosophical statement or a psychological statement rather than a metaphysical statement, it seems to be a precondition for establishing properly harmonious relationships with yourself. And that's, that's man, that's worth thinking about a lot, you know, that you have, because you think, you could think that in some sense you just own yourself, you know, because people do kind of make that claim, especially when they're trying to justify, for example, their right to suicide, that, you know, it's, you, it's your life, it's your body, you're yours to do what you will with. And if that was true, well, then it would seem to me that life would be a lot more straightforward because you would just tell yourself things that you would instantly obey and believe. So first of all, you'd tell yourself all the things that you were going to do, and then you'd just run off and do them, which you don't, obviously, because it's much more difficult than that. And then you'd also say, well, enough of the guilt and the shame and the negative emotion and the disillusionment and the vengefulness and all those things that make life hard, especially the self-recrimination. It's like, what the hell do we need that for? And if we're our masters of our own destiny and owners of our own fate, then why can't we just command to ourselves that that be dispensed with? And, like, that doesn't work. I've never seen anybody able to do that. So, I mean, you can fool yourself for very brief periods of time into thinking that that might work, but, but it doesn't work. And, and that's strange. And this is one of the reasons I love the psychoanalysts, say, eh? because they were really the people, apart from the religious types, who figured out that whatever you are, you're not a unitary spirit that's under your own dominion. You know, you're, you're something like a loose unity of a multiplicity of spirits, many of which are doing their own thing, which you're striving to bring into some form of unity. But even that unity isn't something that's under your control in any real sense. It's, it's a unity that has its own nature that you have to exist in relationship to. And I would also say that that's one of the things that keeps people people's feet firmly on the ground because otherwise you, it's easy to become egotistical and narcissistic. You know, if you, if you think that you're the center of your own being, you know, in some fundamental sense, then you're only, what, you're only beholden to yourself. You're sort of a self-created creature. Perhaps you could think about it that way. But it doesn't work like that. It's like the ideal that constitutes the unity that you might become then sort of manifests itself as something that you could strive toward, but aren't. And it, it, it also serves as a judge. It's the thing that keeps you up at night saying, you know, there's some things you're just not attending to and you should get at it because life is short and there's no shortage of trouble that you might end up in and a wise person would attend to the dictates of his conscience and, and lay out his actions in the world according to what he knows to be true and correct. And that is how people think. And it isn't obvious that we, why we think that way. That this is part of the reason that it seems to me so obvious that we have a religious instinct, because I can't think of what else you would possibly call that other than a religious instinct. Thoughts on the drug epidemic. Well, I'm not sure there is an epidemic any more than there always has been. I know that there is now a tilt towards drugs in, in the U.S. in particular, like meth and, and um, fentanyl and the other opiates, and that's quite a catastrophe. Um, a lot of that is occurring among people who don't have meaning in their lives, I would say. And you might think that's a facile answer, but it's not, you know, like here, here's the rat literature. Like it's, if you take a rat, lab rat, 
typical lab rat is, you know, genetically bred uh, to be identical with many other lab rats, and he lives alone in a cage, and he, he's got a pretty miserable rat life because rats are social animals and they don't like to live in cages by themselves. And you can get a lab rat in a cage addicted to co cocaine in no time flat and he'll, he'll like press a lever for a cocaine reward to pretty much to the, ex to the exclusion of all else, including sex and often including food. But if you take that same rat and you put him in a rat family, you know, in a rat social hierarchy, in a rat environment and give him something that rat rat like to do so that he can be satisfied, it's very difficult to get him addicted to cocaine. And so I would say the reason that people take psychomotor stimulants, and all the drugs of serious abuse are psychomotor stimulants, re regardless of what else they might be, they activate the dopaminergic system, which is the system that tracks reward and that, that is associated, that's activated when you pursue val valuable goal-directed behavior. Um, if you don't have that, if you don't have a valid goal, if you don't have and so no, no real valid meaning in your life, if you don't have a valid ambition, then you don't have any way of activating that system, and why the hell wouldn't you take drugs? It's like you have to have something better to do, to not addict yourself, you know? So, so I would say that a huge part of the current epidemic in, in, in the U.S. in particular is, is manifest among broken men who have no real place in society and providing them with money isn't going to help that. They need a productive and meaningful existence, and, which is the paramount, the paramount goal, should be the paramount goal of social, of social policy, for example. We, we, it isn't the alleviation of poverty that's really the issue, because people in the West aren't poor. There might be a bit of a distribution problem, but we're not poor. What we have is a, a, a what would you say, a we have a problem of meaningful engagement, and that's what has to be addressed, and that's why I do the work that I'm doing. There's an entire, what, literature, psychoanalytic literature, on the dangers of overcompassion, hyper-protectiveness, helicopter parenting, all of that. When you have children, you have to encourage them. You have to encourage them to take risks because they have to grow up and take their place in the world. You can't protect them too much because if you do, you destroy them. That's the motif of Hansel and Gretel, right? Two kids lost in the woods. They find the gingerbread house. That's a little bit too good to be true, right? It's not only shelter when you need it, but it's candy. What lives inside the house that's too good to be true? The witch that devours you, right? That's excess compassion. So you don't want your mother to do everything for you. That's for sure. There's a rule if you're dealing with the elderly and like extended care homes, don't do anything for your clients that they can do themselves because you undermine their autonomy. And so there's a certain amount of harshness that goes along with that, just as there is if you're a good mother, because you have to separate yourself from your child and allow them to make hurtful mistakes, right? I mean, it's, it's very difficult if you're a compassionate person to stand back far enough to let your children take necessary risks. But one thing I'm not getting, there's a big difference between letting people do something for themselves mm -hmm. and saying men should be dangerous. Mm -hmm. By dangerous, that implies I should be ready to threaten someone, to hurt somebody. No, you should be capable of it. But that doesn't mean you should use it. There's nothing to you otherwise. Like if you're not a formidable force, there's, not, there's no morality in your self-control. If you're incapable of violence, not being violent isn't a virtue. People who teach martial arts know this full well, right? If you learn a martial art, you learn to be dangerous, but simultaneously you learn to control it. Both of those come together. And the combination of that capacity for danger and the capacity for control is what brings about the virtue. Otherwise, you confuse weakness with, with moral virtue. I'm harmless, therefore I'm good. It's like, no, that isn't how it works. That isn't how it works at all. If you're harmless, you're just weak. And if you're weak, you're not going to be good. You can't be, because it takes strength to be good. It's very difficult to be good. Your perceptual structures are determined by the goals that you have at hand. I mean, some of that's, that's not completely true because your perceptual systems also have limitations, right? There's things you can't see or hear even if you need to. So there are limitations built in, but within that set of limitations, you're still trying to tune your perceptions to your motivated goals. And that's also very useful to think about when you're trying to understand artificial intelligence because for human beings, without goals, there's no perception. Because there's no filtering mechanism that you can use to determine the level of resolution at which you perceive. Anyway, so there's, the, there's a thing made of smaller things which are made out of smaller things. And it's, so, it's kind of my iconic representation of the complexity of the world. And then you could think, well, what is this? How can you see this object? And I think if you just look at it, 
you can detect, it's like a Necker cube, you know those cubes that, that, that are line drawings that you can see the front of and then it'll flip to the back, have you seen those? So this is kind of Necker cube-like, or at least it is for me, in that when I look at it, my perceptions play around with it. Sometimes I focus on the kind of cross-like shape in the middle, and sometimes I can see these other lines, and then sometimes I'll focus on that square, and sometimes I can see the little dots there, or maybe one dot, and my perceptions are going like this, trying to fit a pattern to it. And I, you can kind of detect that when you're watching it. And so I would say, well, you have the options of perceiving this in its full complexity, or you can simplify it, essentially, there's lots of ways you can simplify it, but some of them are laid out there. So you take the compl complex thing, you make a low resolution representation of it. So that's, its rough, that's the rough area that all those dots occupy. That's the rough area bro broken down to its four most fundamental quadrants. That might be how you would look at it if, if this was a map of an orchard and you were trying to walk from south to north, that would be a useful representation. This combines this and this, that's, <clears throat> the <hi> <coughs> That's the highest level of resolution that you can perceive this object at that's lower resolution than the object itself. So the first issue is, how should you look at things? Well, that's a problem that intelligence has to solve. So that's one of the problems that intelligence goes after. And then I think what happens is we have the thing in itself, and then we simplify it with a perception, and, and that's like a, an iconic representation. And then we, we nail the iconic representation with a word. And that's how we compress the world's complexity into something that we can manage. We take the complex thing, make it into an icon, and represent the icon with a word. And then when I throw you the word, so to speak, you decompose it into the icon and then decompose it even further into the thing if you, can't, if you know the icon and you know the thing. And so then we can use shorthand, right? Because you have representational structures and so do I, and I'm just tossing you markers about your representational structures and you can unfold them. That's what you do when you're reading a novel because the novel comes alive in your imagination in your own idiosyncratic way. And it wouldn't if you didn't understand the references of the novel, right? The, the novelist has to assume that your basic perceptual structures and your intuitions and your instincts are basically the same as his or hers, because otherwise they have to assume that, because otherwise they would be lost in an infinite regressive explanation. So, and it, it's problematic often, for example, if you start reading Victorian novels, you may find that it takes a while to get into them because the presuppositions, the expectations are slightly different and so is the language. You have to update the representations. The notion that our morality is linked to our desire to survive is I'm perfectly fine with that. The devil's in the details to some degree. I mean, one of the fields of endeavor that I've been particularly struck by is uh, the work of people like Franz de Waal. And Franz de Waal has written a series, and also Jacques Panksepp. Hey, I'll tell you something cool about rats. Some of you, I'd like to do that. Uh, some of you have probably heard this before, but this affective neuroscientist named Jacques Panksepp, he studied rats for a long time, and he's a very sophisticated researcher, and I think he was one of the greatest neuroscientists who lived in the last 50 years. I, I don't think there's really any question of that. He might have been one of the top three. Might have been... He'd be in the top three. It'd be a tight race up at the top three. He did this great experiment. It was so smart. So juvenile rats like to play. And they like to wrestle. They like to engage in rough and tumble play. And you might say, well, how do you know a rat likes to do something? It's like, are you anthropomorphizing? And the first thing I would say to that is you should anthropomorphize unless there's evidence to the contrary because we share a biological platform with rats, and they're a lot like us. And a rat is a lot more like you than your stupid model of a human being is like a human being. So you try building a rat, it's hard. So anyways, you can tell rats want to play because if you put them in a little arena where they can rough and tumble play and wrestle, and then you bring them there the next time and you make them work to open the door to play, they'll work. And so that's how we know you like something, you'll work for it, you know, so you can apply that to rats. And they'll work hard for it. And rats deprived of play, their prefrontal cortexes don't mature. And they, they're kind of hyperactive, which might tell us something about boys in school, but we won't go into that. 
If you take a rat of the same age as another rat and you put him in a play area, but the other rat has a 10% weight advantage, the big rat will pin the little rat. And they actually pin each other, pretty much like dogs do when they're wrestling. Well, they don't pin quite as much, but humans certainly do it. And pin means dominate, dominance, or that's one interpretation. You only make that interpretation if you think that the hierarchies that rats live in are dominance hierarchies predicated on the expression of power. And we all kind of think that because we use the term dominance hierarchy. But, you know, that's a political term as well as a scientific term. And it's predicated on the notion that the fundamental basis of hierarchical structure among mammals and other complex organisms is power, and that's wrong. And it's not just wrong. It's, it's corrosively wrong. It's misleadingly wrong. It's like it's seriously and not acceptably wrong. Anyways, you pair the rats once and you think, hey, big rat wins over little rat, establishes dominance, that's the basis of the relationship. But the thing about rats is, like people, they don't just play once because they live in social groups that are reciprocal. They play repeatedly. And Panksepp, being a very smart researcher, realized this, so he paired rats to play, the same rats, over multiple occasions. And the first thing he observed was the second time the rats got together, the little rat had to invite the big rat to play. You know, and rats do the same sort of thing that dogs do when they want to play, and, and that, that play behavior is so cross-species common that all of you know when your dog wants to play. You know, you can, you can take your dog and whack him like that if you do it right, and he goes and tries to bite you, but not really, right? He plays and his tail's wagging, and, and when ro dogs are playing, it kind of looks like dominance behavior like it does among boys, because boys really like to rough and tumble play, by the way, although girls like it too, but not as much. You can distinguish the play behavior from aggression, and if you can't, that means you never had any friends. I mean, no, I mean that. that, that's, that I mean that. That's what it means. It means, that's what it means, because part of being able to have friends is be, to be able to identify aggression versus play. And, and part of playing is to pretend to be aggressive quite aggressively, but still be playing, right? It's, there's a big, tremendous social skill in that. Anyways, the little rat has to ask the big rat to play, which I imagine is somewhat you know, humiliating for the little rat, but he's the little rat, so tough luck for him. And the big rat can deign to play, and then they play. And then you can observe how they play over repeated bouts. If the big rat doesn't let the little rat win, at least 30% of the time, even though he could win 100% of the time, the little rat will no longer invite him to play. And you think, yeah. It's like, no, not yeah. Like the emergence of morality in rats through play. That's a big discovery, man. That's a big discovery. And that's, there's that reciprocity, eh? That, that exists within the rat hierarchy. And stable hierarchies in complex mammals are not predicated on power. So Franz de Waal has showed quite clearly that, you know, that, so chimps have a pretty rough hierarchy and it's pretty male dominated. Now bonobos are quite different. We won't talk about them because it's not germane to this particular point. But you might think, you know, the biggest chimpanzee with the biggest teeth He's the tyrant. He's the winner. And that happens sometimes. There are tyrannical chimpanzee societies. But what Duval has shown quite clearly is that I don't care how big and tough you are. If you don't play fair, two guys 90% your size can get together one day when you're not feeling so well and tear you into bits. And that's exactly what happens among the chimps. So tyranny, you know, that can be a route to dominance. It can even be a route to sexual access because it is the case among chimpanzees that males who are higher in the power hierarchy are more likely to father offspring, not because the female chimps choose them, because female chimps aren't choosy, unlike human females. It's a profound difference between the two species, but because the big, that more uh, superordinate male chimps chase the subordinates away. So, but DeWall has shown quite clearly that the 
males who manage to occupy positions of authority and competence longest in chimpanzee hierarchies are intensely reciprocal with the other males, more so than the other chimps in the hierarchy. They do a lot of mutual grooming and are preferentially attentive to the females and their infants. And so even among chimps, and chimps can be damn brutal, right? Jane, Jane Goodall discovered, I think it was 1975, another landmark in, in late 20th century scientists at science that, and this was a real blow to, to the social construction constructionist utopians, juvenile chimps patrol the borders of their territory, and if they come across chimps from other troops and outnumber them, they will tear them into bits. And chimps are unbelievably strong, and it's unbelievably brutal. And so Goodall basically discovered that chimps have the human equi or the, the equivalent of human tribal warfare. And that's quite frightening if, if you're sensible, because you know, you might be the kind of optimist who thinks that human conflict is caused by capitalism or some bloody daft notion like that. And that wouldn't that be lovely because then it would be, you could just get rid of it by getting rid of capitalism, which you wouldn't be able to do anyways, but you know what I mean. It's, but if it's, I mean, we split from chimps about seven million years ago. And if the problem of intergroup aggression is that deep, it's a terrible problem. No, because people think that the purpose of memory is to remember the past. And that's not the purpose of memory. The purpose of memory is to extract out from the past lessons to structure the future. And that, that's the purpose of personal memory. And so you're done with a memory when you've extracted out the information that you can use to guide yourself properly in the future. So if you have a traumatic memory, for example, that's really obsessing you, if you analyze that memory to the point where you figured out how you put yourself at risk and you can determine how you might avoid that in the future, then the emotion associated with that goes away. So memory is a, has a very pragmatic function. And cultural memory is the same thing, is that we need to extract out stories from our past that structure our future. And we need that because, well, first of all, if you don't have a purpose, let's say, it isn't that your life becomes neutral in a, in a meaningless sense. It's that your life becomes characterized by unbearable suffering because the baseline condition of life is something like unbearable suffering. And what you have to set against that is a noble and worthwhile purpose. And hopefully, hopefully your determination of that purpose is buttressed to some degree by the wisdom of the past because you can't conjure something like that up on your own. And if you provide people with nobility of purpose, then they can tolerate the suffering of existence without becoming entirely corrupted by it. And cultures that don't do that, it isn't even so much that they die, it's that cultures that don't do that are dead. They're done. They don't have a story anymore. And they don't have a call to adventure. And then, well, then everyone suffers stupidly as a consequence. It's a very bad thing. So Churchill made the same observation that many of the great psychologists and, and philosophers made in the early part of the 20th century. It's like, bring the story forward and, and propagate it and make it the most noble possible story. And then you motivate people to do, to transcend themselves, which they need to do. So yes, he's exactly right in his diagnosis. The goal of life is to live a life which in retrospect we are glad that we lived. It's important to give ourselves perspective, to develop that metacognizance, to step away from the urgent, to step away from the phenomenological day-to-day -day existence, because the present self is a petulant child. It's lazy and it wants the path of least resistance and that glass of wine and that new movie on Netflix and the couch looks really comfortable. Very rarely does it yeah, do... Yeah, well, that's the danger with impulsive happiness is that it does have that present-bound quality. And in retrospect that can lead to a life that's not well lived. Generally that, yes, yes, yes. Life definitely places phil philosophical demands on you, whether you want it to or not. And so it is useful to step back. I mean, that's likely why the trait openness evolved. That's the creativity dimension. That's the dimension that, that allows people to engage in philosophical discourse and to think laterally. And it, it does allow you to step back and look at things on a broader scale. 
and to generate creative alternatives. The problem with examining your assumptions is it's very disquieting, you know, because you want things to act the way you predict and desire them to act. And you work within a set of axioms and you act them out in order to maintain that predictability, that desirable predictability. If you mess around, the more fundamental the axiom that you question, the more uncertainty you release. And some of that can be positive, but a plenty of it can be anxiety provoking. I mean, just imagine that you're in a relationship and, you know, it's, it's maybe a year into it and you haven't formalized and finalized it. But then one day you allow yourself to ask the question, is this the relationship I want to be in? Well, that's a fundamental question, but just imagine now you're destabilizing your entire future. You're destabilizing your present. You're destabilizing your past because while engaging in the relationship, you're acting out the assumption that it's the proper relationship. But now you question that. That means the story you told yourself about what was happening while it happened, even though it's already happened, was wrong and something else had happened. And then you have to think through what actually happened. So it's unbelievably demanding. And the more axiomatic the assumption, the more certainty is cast into, into troublesome chaos. Now, you could say, yeah, but the alternative is worse. And I believe that often that's true. But, but the thing about the alternative is that you can always forestall it, right? Manana, you manana. Can ask that question tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You bet, you bet. And, and it's a very powerful temptation and no wonder. You know, do you want to dig up the body now or do you want to wait a month? It's like, well, it'll be more rotten in a month, but, but it's not a month. It's not now, right? It's not now. And so I, I understand why people don't want to delve into things, even if their emotions indicate that they should. I, I mean, I would see this all the time. If you're trying to settle an important issue with your partner, let's say, that can be a tremendously troublesome excavation process. And there's no shortage of pain. But if you sort it out, then maybe things can be better. It doesn't mean it's easy or, 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 uh, or pleasant. Quite the contrary. It's like surgery. It, it's, not, it's like surgery to remove something you know, that shouldn't be there. It's necessary, but man, it's still surgery. So then you could imagine, I have this cottage in Northern Ontario and we're fortunate. Uh, it's dark there and so you can go down to the dock at night and in the clear sky you can see the vast array of the infinite heavens arrayed above you, you know, and it's something that people who live in cities really don't get to experience anymore. They don't experience the sunset, which we also go out on our boat and watch pretty much every day. Um, and that puts you in, in touch with what inspires awe. You know, and that's not a propositional experience, that's a pre-propositional experience, and it's, it's a deep biological experience. It's, in, it's embedded in the prey response to a predator in part, you know, because if you, if you feel awe, sometimes you can feel that with music. A lot of people who are high in openness to experience will feel that quite frequently under the effect of aesthetic experiences, interestingly enough. Their hair stands on end, that's piloerection. That's what a cat does when it's frightened by a dog, like the little boy at the beginning of the story. You know, the cat puffs up to look big, to be like me meta cat, so that it can contend with, it can contend with dogs, or at least it can look like it might. And so when, when it sees a dog, the sight of the dog calls the best forth out of the cat. Well, that's what happens when you look at the night sky. You know, it calls to you, right? Ha. Dr. Dawkins sent me a paper last week in preparation for a discussion that we're going to have tomorrow. And it was a very interesting paper, and I think I read it about 25 years ago, and he said, any functioning animal has to be a microcosm, a model of the environment within, within which it finds itself. Well, that's true of us. And so when you look at the night sky and that sense of awe grips you and calls something out of you, right, to respond to your encounter with the infant, and even your encounter with mortality, your encounter with finitude and limitation, all of that in relationship to the infinite, 
That sense of awe is also the calling forth of something out of you that can respond to the challenge of that infinite. Well, that's the microcosm within, you know? It's a reflection of the structure of the cosmos itself. That's the divine ideal. And we either imitate that or we fail to imitate that or we pursue the opposite path. Those are the options, you know? And it's given our technological power and our capacity for wholesale atrocity, it's time we woke up and realized it. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. To learn some powerful habits to start every day with, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. But if there's something inside of you that is restless for that next level, we're gonna have to start measuring. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it. You know, if you ever try to lose weight or gain, you notice, apparently this is weightlifting talk. <laughs> 